This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Athena Actipis, who heads up the cooperation initiative at Arizona State University. It's, wait, it's the... Interdisciplinary Cooperation Initiative. Well, of course. That's why we've got you here, because it's interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. You've got a background in psychology, but you've been spending the last, I don't know, more than a decade studying cancer. And you're the author of this book right here, The Cheating Cell, How Evolution Helps Us Understand and Treat Cancer. Welcome, Athena. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you because, you know, there aren't a lot of people who are like, hey, let's talk about being interdisciplinary. And it's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> There's this famous quote by Dobzhansky, which says that everything in biology only makes sense through the lens of evolution or something like that. It's nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, I think. And yet, even though we've taken an evolutionary lens to so many other aspects of life, Cancer has been one area that has not really seen a whole lot of evolutionary modeling or evolutionary attention brought to it. And I really enjoyed this book because what you're doing is you're taking an evolutionary lens to cancer. And what's surprising is that in areas like pest control, evolution has begun to play a huge role and it's changed the way we think about managing pests. And if we view cancer as a pest or some kind of parasite that's taking over our body, then it would make sense for us to apply these evolutionary approaches. And that's what you do in this book. I mean, you bring together a variety of strands of research, but it's really fundamentally rooted in an understanding of cooperation and multi-level selection. And so you're looking at the individual organism as a collection of genes that cooperate, but then you're also kind of looking at cancer as a collection of genes that are cooperating. And so the story of cancer's dissemination and our attempts to fight it are really all about either promoting or discouraging cooperation, depending on who it is that we want to win this battle. I don't know even know where to start because it's such an interesting story, but I guess you've been interested in cooperation pretty much your entire academic life. So how did you bridge this gap between the study of cooperation and your interest in cancer? Well, to be honest, my interest in cancer came from applying evolutionary and ecological ideas to cancer. So I've been working in cooperation theory for my whole, I mean, even before I had any academic position. When I was an undergrad, I was sitting in my dorm room programming agent-based models because I like really wanted to see what strategies could work in spatial prisoner's dilemma game. I was like, I definitely want to do this in a spatial way because I feel like that's how it should be done. So I've just been super curious about the evolution of cooperation in terms of the sort of very abstract underlying principles that can make cooperation stable or that can undermine it. Yeah, that's just a thread that's gone through my entire life from the time I first realized that evolution could be applied to behavior. And so when I was a postdoc at the University of Arizona, so I'm at ASU now, I was a postdoc at U of A down in Tucson with John Pepper, who is really one of the original cooperation theorists also. He did a lot of really important modeling around something called the environmental feedback model, which is really similar to the sort of walkaway model and the basic idea that you need positive assortment for cooperation to be viable. Cooperators need to preferentially interact with other cooperators to be viable. So I started working with him for my postdoc. And he was, in addition to his work on cooperation, he was also working on cancer as a sort of evolutionary system. And I remember a few weeks into working with him, I was like, John, I know you're doing the evolution of cooperation stuff and you're doing the evolution in cancer stuff, but there's like an intersection of that Venn diagram, right? Where like the evolution of cooperation applies in really important ways to understanding what cancer is, how it evolves, because the very evolution of multicellularity is the evolution of very large scale cooperation. At least when you think of multicellularity like us, we're 30 trillion cells that are cooperating and coordinating every second to make us functional. That's completely mind-blowing, frankly. And so I basically said, hey, like, what happens if we start applying these frameworks 
from evolutionary biology and ecology, very specifically to questions in cancer from how do bodies monitor for cancer, right? Because that's a sort of cheater detection problem to how do cells evolve to be motile, to move and ultimately become metastatic, which is really the main clinical problem in cancer. And it turns out there are lots of theories and sub-theories in evolutionary biology and ecology that at that point, this was about 20 years ago, like people hadn't been applying those ideas. Actually, this was more like what, 15 years ago or so when it was 20 years ago when I started working on cooperation theory. And then, yeah, I guess it was about 2008, 2009, when I really dove into working on evolution and cancer, applying life history theory, applying dispersal theory, you know, just applying sort of the basics of evolution, of cooperation, and the frameworks from there. Yeah, so it was really the applications of cooperation theory, ecology, evolutionary biology, that drew me into cancer, as opposed to being interested in cancer and then bringing it together. For a lot of people, when they read Richard Dawkins, there's this incredible realization that there's much more to Darwin than simply survival of the fittest individual, that evolution is operating at the level of the gene, right? He came up with this concept of the selfish gene. And when you expand that, you start seeing these communities everywhere. And so this idea that Every organism is a collection of these trillions of cells, and each of these cells has their own agenda to some degree, right? So why is it that we don't just explode? (laughs) Because every single cell is trying to pursue its own individual interest, and yet somehow they all get together and cooperate to promote the best interest of the collectivity. It's really a remarkable example of cooperation. I mean, one way to think about the individual organism's body is like a hive of social insects, like ants and termites and so forth. So maybe just start there. How does it make sense to think about cells versus individuals in the same way that we might think about multi-level selection, individuals and society? Let me first say we could spend this whole hour just thinking about how amazing it is that we are not a pile of mush. It really is unbelievable because every one of the cells in our body is expressing genes, is creating gene products that are interacting with the cells nearby, changing the electrical signaling around them. Even cells that aren't neurons are constantly altering their electrical signaling in ways that allow us to function as a unit. And, you know, we have this illusion of being unitary too, when actually we are made of trillions of cells. So I think, honestly, maybe we shouldn't take the whole hour just thinking about that. But it's one of those things where you have to, like, sit with that for a minute and realize how insane it is that we are functioning. And if you really absorb that fact, then the only sort of next place to go with that is to realize that the scale of cooperation, that it's possible for evolution by natural selection to select for is completely mind-blowing, right? Selection has been acting on us as organisms for so many millions of years that all of the things that we think of as adaptations of an organism are functional on this level of trillions of cells. And the kinds of processes that are going on at the cellular level that underlie all of these adaptations, each of them is just beyond our comprehension in terms of how the molecular mechanisms scale up to what manifests as our physiology and behavior. But every cell in the body has a common ancestor, right? There's been evolution taking place from the moment of conception, where each new generation of cells is, in some sense, competing against all of the other cells at that same level, right? And you talk about the fasciation of plants. And I guess it's kind of like a birthmark, right? So isn't a birthmark a bunch of cells that all have some common ancestor? There was some mutation early in development, and then all the cells descended from that cell with that mutation have that kind of coloration. I was surprised when you point out that every single multicellular organism has some type of cancer, even if we don't call it cancer. 
Yeah, certainly every type of multicellular organism has the potential for dysregulation of growth and differentiation. If you have cells that are growing when they shouldn't, not dying when they should, if you have cells not differentiating the way they ought to, all of those certainly fit within the phenotypes of cancer that we think about, even if a clinician might not want to call it cancer or a plant biologists might not want to call aphasiation cancer for all sorts of reasons. But in terms of the cellular processes, there's certainly similarity there in terms of what gets dysregulated or broken in terms of the genes. The somatic evolution theory just says, okay, every generation, you know, we're rolling a dice, there's going to be some mutations. And then sometimes you get unlucky and you get a bad roll of the dice. And that's what we call cancer, right? The idea of somatic evolution is that within our bodies, evolution is taking place among cells. So we typically think about evolution happening among organisms in a population in the natural world, right? So you have a bunch of humans in their environment. You have a bunch of birds living in their environment. Whatever it is, we're thinking about these populations existing in the natural world. But every multicellular organism is sort of a society unto itself. It's a community. It's a population, right, of cells. And from the point of conception on, as you were pointing out, you can have evolution in that population of cells. Now, we have a lot of mechanisms that have evolved to suppress that cell level evolution inside us or to channel it in ways that might be functional. Like, for example, our immune system actually uses somatic evolution to fight infection. But the process of somatic evolution is happening nonetheless. It's been controlled and harnessed in a different kind of way than would even be possible for populations of organisms to evolve because we have such higher level function as a unit. But a lot of the underlying principles are really the same. They just manifest a little bit differently. If you use this metaphor of the obnoxious roommate, right? You know, the freeloading roommate, the roommate that kind of hangs out and takes more than their fair share of nutrition from the refrigerator and kind of takes over the couch. And in economics, we tend to think that the free riders are ultimately going to win, right? If we don't have some robust mechanisms for suppressing them. So what exactly are the mechanisms that our body has in place to keep these free riders from taking over and inviting their friends in and multiplying and just packing our apartment full of lazy free riders? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I've had a lazy free rider in my house one too many times. So it's something <laughs> I've thought about quite a bit. There are a number of different mechanisms, actually, on different levels. It's actually it's pretty amazing if you think about it, like how many different sort of redundant systems there are for regulating cooperation inside the body. So you have processes that go on inside the cell where the cell is basically like monitoring itself for is it expressing genes that it should are there proteins around that suggest that things are happening that shouldn't be happening? Are there viruses around that suggest the cell is being hijacked, which can lead to cancer sometimes? So you have these cell intrinsic mechanisms. That includes genes like TP53, which produces the protein P53, which plays a big role in shutting cells down that are not behaving properly, keeping them from going through their cell cycle and dividing. So you have these cell intrinsic systems. You also have these sort of neighborhood systems where cells are monitoring cells around them to make sure that those cells are behaving properly. And every cell basically has within it a sort of automatic shutdown system so that if it's not getting the right signals from its neighbors, mm -hmm. then it apoptoses. So it commits cellular suicide if its neighbors are like, mm, I don't know, you seem like you're being a little weird today. Then the cell is just like, I'm out. There's this really sensitive system, actually, where cells, if they're getting signals from their neighbors, so they could stop getting survival signals. So mm -hmm. cells are sort of always sending the signals saying, hey, stay alive, stay alive, stay alive. If they stop getting those survival signals, they apoptose. Or if they get signals saying, hey, actually, you need to stop being a threat here mm -hmm. to the body then they will apoptose. So you have neighborhood level, and then you also have system-wide level. Before we get into system-wide stuff, I mean, what you're saying is that every single cell is like a CPU, right? Absolutely. It's doing a ton of information processing. Mm -hmm. It's continually yeah. scouring itself. It's also scouring its environment, and it's got a automatic off switch 
which if it gets either a signal to turn itself off or if it doesn't get the signals to stay on, then it shuts off. Yeah, it's got a bunch of fail safes. A hot topic right now is AI and fail safes and all this kind of stuff. Maybe we could learn a little something from thinking about how the multicellular body has regulated itself so that rogue elements don't just take over and destroy us from the inside out. Not that Mm -hmm. that's going to happen with AI. And this information processing system ultimately, I think, can get hijacked or it can stop working properly. And that's what can give rise to cancer. That's certainly one of the routes to cancer is that processing system for detecting when cells are not behaving properly. If that is not functioning properly or if it's getting hijacked, that's absolute vulnerability. I mean, how does the immune system and other system-wide systems also help to keep cancer at bay? Yeah, I mean, the immune system is the major one here and many different dimensions to it, of course. But if there are regions of the body where cells are proliferating, where maybe there's chronic issues, where cells seem to be expressing proteins that they shouldn't be, the immune system will go to those regions and see what's up. And if there's a problem, then the immune cells may go in and actually destroy the source of the problem, which could be an early tumor that is maybe avoiding some of those internal cell intrinsic mechanisms and neighborhood mechanisms. So it's a way of the body responding if there is some avoidance of those other potential mechanisms for control. Evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology is all about trade-offs. And so a lot of the book really is talking about why cancer to some degree is inevitable, or at least that the optimal amount of cancer is non-zero because it's the price we pay for a lot of other things. So can you talk a bit about that? There's so many different trade-offs involved here, but what are some of the main trade-offs? Just to start, all else being equal, if it were possible to have no cancer, of course, that would be the best, right? But the cost of getting rid of it, at least the way we're built, it would be too high. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a really important and hard thing to even wrap one's mind around at first is just that in order to have a body that would be not susceptible to cancer at all, that the ways that evolution could select for that include shutting a lot of things down that are important for other functions. So the example I like the most is thinking about wound healing because the mechanisms are sort of really, really clear and you can see the trade-off well. Let's say I get cut on my hand. In order for that cut to heal, there has to be proliferation of the cells on the edges and then movement of those cells together to close that wound. Now, if a cell or a set of cells is going to be able to switch into a gear to proliferate and move when certain conditions occur, like with a wound, then you have a body that has cells that are ready to shift into a proliferation and movement state with certain signals. And that then creates a vulnerability to if those signals can be somehow produced or if like a chronic wounding type environment can be sort of simulated by rogue cells, then you have a situation where those cells are just, they're able to go into that cancer-like state much more readily. If you wanted to down-regulate all of that a bunch, then maybe you would be less likely to get cancer, but you would be more likely to die of an infection from a wound that is healing really fucking slowly. So it's a trade-off there. It's just something to keep in mind that like our bodies are constantly trying to do lots of things and doing a exceptionally good job at suppressing cancer actually could interfere with a lot of the other things that the body's trying to do. So that's just one instance of the bigger trade-off between promoting cell growth and cellular control, right? That's the big trade-off that you talk about. I guess the only way to really get rid of it would be to be a unicellular organism, right? (laughs) Because they they don't get cancer. Is that right? Like you're a one-celled organism and you just clone yourself, you're not going to get cancer. Well, if we define cancer as the evolution of these selfish lineages within a body, then by definition, a unicellular organism can't get cancer. But what are some of the other trade-offs? In other words, the likelihood of getting cancer if it were lower... What are some of the other things, bad things that we would expect to see? 
you know, another interesting set of trade-offs can occur with reproductive competitiveness. And in order to, for example, to have a large body size, which in some species, having large body size is very important in mating success, sometimes for males, sometimes for females, that growing big and growing fast Being able to do those things also means that if you grow quickly, you can do that potentially through not having as high of a level of monitoring of mutations as your cells divide. And so you could grow quickly, but maybe with more errors, which might in the end leave you more susceptible to cancer. But perhaps you would have an advantage in being larger, faster, and that would allow you to reproduce sooner. So that's another potential trade-off with body size. There are also some potential trade-offs with fertility, which is quite interesting. But broadly, I think when we think about reproductive function, there are a lot of things that have to do with cell growth, proliferation, apoptosis. And we know that when it comes to sort of selection pressures, those pressures that have to do with reproduction, reproductive success, very, very strong, right? It's definitely a place where if you think about, oh, well, natural selection selects for organisms that are good at surviving and reproducing. Well, sometimes those things trade off against each other. And cancer resistance and the longer survival you can get from cancer resistance can trade off with reproduction, can trade off with maintaining your body, somatic maintenance, including wound healing and cellular repair, DNA repair, things like that. What about aging? That's also a trade off, right? Yeah. So the question about aging is pretty, it's pretty complicated in terms of the mechanisms underlying it. And cancer is ultimately really a disease of aging. You could think of it as a disease of aging. When when organisms just stick around for longer and longer, there's more opportunities for cancer cells to arise or precancer cells to arise and be selected for. So that's kind of the primary issue with aging. There are also these sort of questions about when can you actually get selection for longer lifespans and even after reproductive age, right? You can sort of show with some models that, you know, if you have a species like humans where you have a lot of parental investment or, you know, other ways that you're contributing to the survival and reproduction of individuals that share your genes in one way or another. So cooperative breeding is another way to get it. Then you can actually get selection for cancer resistance past reproductive mm-hmm. age and these sort of longer hopefully cancer-free lifespans. Usually not cancer-free. If half of your story is about cancer as a free rider violating the norms of cooperativeness among cells, the other half of your story is how cancer cells seem to cooperate with each other in order to be stronger when it comes to thriving within their host. Could you talk a bit about that? One of the sort of dirty tricks that cancer cells have up their collective sleeves is that within their genomes are all of the genes that allow cells to cooperate really, really well to make our bodies functional. And so if those genes and those mechanisms and systems can be repurposed for almost a sort of evolution of proto-multicellular entities that are cancerous entities within the body, then we don't really have a lot of good defenses against that. If cancer cells re-evolve these abilities to communicate, to coordinate their behavior, to divide labor, to move collectively through the body, these are all things that we know cancer cells can evolve to do inside the body, then not only is that an issue because those mechanisms already exist, but also because our bodies are a vast ecosystem Mm -hmm. for cancer cells. And there are so many subhabitats and regions and places where cancer cells and groups of cancer cells can be. And so early in the evolution of cancer, you know, before you can even detect anything like invasion and metastasis, there could very well be these microscopic populations of these groups of cancer cells that are in all these little niches that may be competing with each other 
to basically be better at coordinating, getting resources from those environments. And the scale of cooperation that can go on inside the human body during cancer progression is vaster than all of the time that homo sapiens have had to evolve if you scale things because the population sizes are huge generation times are really fast and so it's a mind-blowing microcosm of evolution of cooperation that could be going on just on a month-to-month basis as cancer is evolving inside the body simultaneously awe-inspiring and totally terrifying Sometimes I'll think about it for a while and I'll be like, oh, that's so awesome. And I'll be like, no, that really sucks. But like it is also really intriguing that all of these things can be going on such a small scale that we can't even observe it. We don't have the tools yet to really be able to see what is going on in terms of those dynamics of the evolution of cooperation among these cancer cell clusters that may be competing with each other in a meta population, you know, at any stages in cancer progression. I teach strategy and game theory, and I use a bunch of biological examples. And I remember when I first learned about group selection, it was kind of hard to make sense of it, and it was hard to explain it to people. But then when you talk about the host-parasite relationship, then I think for a lot of people it kicks in, right? Where the parasites, if they kill the host too quickly, then they don't really get to reproduce a whole lot, right? And so there's Mm -hmm. this trade-off. And it's in the interest of the individual parasite to reproduce like crazy, but it's in the best interest of the community of parasites to reproduce in a more cooperative way. So how do these parasitical cancer cells cooperate with each other? What are the mechanisms that they use to do both niche construction, and you talk about niche construction, and the example I use in my game theory class, I talk about biofilms. Right. And Mm -hmm. it seems like what's going on there, it's very similar to what goes on with quorum sensing in bacteria. Yeah, I think there are a lot of parallels there. With regard to the host parasite Mm -hmm. evolution, there's a little bit of a breakdown of some of that with cancer because typically cancer does not live past the host, right? And there is no opportunity then for the cancer cells to evolve anything having to do with like keeping the body alive in order to have it transmit. Now, there's an exception when we talk about transmissible cancers, which there are a number of species where that has happened spontaneously. Tasmanian devils, I think the best known example, but there's also a bunch of clams and mussels where you have that and and also some dogs. In humans, it doesn't happen unless you have a surgical insertion of cells or you have immune suppression, you have accidents, things like that. When it comes to humans and transmissible cancer, it's not really something we have to worry about. But it does mean that when we're talking about the evolution of cancer inside the body, we're usually just talking about it as just one lineage that, of course, it can diversify. Lots of things can happen inside that body, but it doesn't really go forth from there. But to return to your question about the mechanisms that can underlie sort of what's going on in terms of the cooperation, things like cells producing growth factors for each other. So, you know, they're in a little clump producing growth factors. They might be responding themselves to the growth factors that they produce, but also their neighbors are going to be responding by growing. They may be producing survival factors that basically just say, hey, stick around. They can be evading the immune system in a way that provides benefits to the cells that are nearby them or on the inside of a little cluster that's evading the immune system. They can divide labor with some cells being in a state where they're dividing more. So, you know, what have been called cancer stem cells, while other cells may be doing other things like consuming resources and evading the immune system or really any number of things that cancer cells might do to gather resources, reproduce, etc. So there are a lot of strategies that are available for cancer cells to use to benefit themselves. And many of them, there's already evidence that cooperation is happening when it comes to those mechanisms. Cell movement is another one where it's like we know that for cells to move around as a group, you need to have some adhesive factors, right? So the cells need to be like a little sticky. So they need to be producing that, which ends up being a public good, right? Because if the cells are producing it, then other cells can stick as well. And 
or you need some mechanisms of coordinated movement to get in and out of the blood vessels to get through the tissues. That's another place where you need the evolution of not just cooperation, but actually coordinated signaling and coordinated changes in phenotype because it's not that straightforward for a clump of cells to get from inside the bloodstream back into the tissues or vice versa. There has to be a sort of dance of electrical signaling and cells contorting themselves to get around and get through. When you talked about the metastases, I was thinking of human colonization. It seemed like the Vikings going out and settling in Greenland or Iceland or whatever, or the Greeks or the Phoenicians going and setting up colonies in Sicily and Spain. And then they would, those colonies would set up their own colonies and some of them would flow back to the homeland. I mean, it's very much like the cooperative enterprise of colonization, isn't it? In some ways, there are parallels there. And there have been findings showing that cells that So, you know, you start with a primary tumor, you can get secondary tumors Mm -hmm. that grow, that cells will be found back at the primary tumor sometimes. Whether that's just the result of random flow through the body or whether there are processes going on that are similar to what happens in human colonies or in ant colonies, whether resources are actually getting brought back to the primary tumor. All of these are things that as evolutionary biologists looking at these systems, we might say, hey, this looks like a parallel to ant colonies in some ways and honeybee colonies in other ways and then human societies in other ways. And we can use that as a way of generating hypotheses, right, which then we can go in and test. And to me, that's one of the really exciting things about being interdisciplinary in this way is you can make those parallels and then use those as ways of generating new hypotheses and predictions, which then you can go back and test. And it's also, in my mind, a good way to get reasonable priors about What's the likelihood that the system will be like this versus that if it's something that we have no way of gathering data about? And I think that's one of the really powerful things about an evolutionary approach in general and then specifically using the sort of multi-level framework for applying ideas from one system to another. It's a way of just getting some bearings that allow you to start asking the right questions and making testable hypotheses and starting to test the predictions that come from them. If biology is all about understanding the world, I mean, medicine is about changing the world. And your work has profound implications for how we should approach cancer therapies, cancer treatment. Like how you quote Lao Tzu in The Art of War. The best way to win a war might not be with head-on confrontation, right? There may be other ways, smarter ways of dealing with the enemy. To what extent can we learn from evolution of cancer directly? And to what extent can we borrow insights from evolution as applied to other kinds of pest control, other kinds of the use of antibiotics, the use of pesticides and so forth. We seem to have learned our lesson in those domains more than we have in the world of cancer. How does thinking of cancer as a cooperative parasite that breaks through the intercellular cooperation of the body, how does that affect the way we should be thinking about treating cancer? Great questions. And I'd give kind of two answers. I mean, there's a lot of things I could say, but one of them is that if we think about cancer as an evolutionary system, as an evolutionary problem, if we think of cancer as fundamentally being a process, right? It's a process of evolution happening inside the body in a way that is favoring cells that are not necessarily the cells that are aligned with our interests, right, as beings, then that allows us to really shift the question about intervention to how could we, instead of targeting cancer and trying to kill cancer, which sometimes that makes sense, but we can instead think how can we actually shape the process of evolution in the body? How can we make it less likely that cells in the body will evolve into cancer-like phenotype? Can we directly limit the process of evolution in the body? Are there interventions that we could actually design that would change how evolution is proceeding? For example, 
you can target the parameter of mutation rate, if you can reduce mutation rate, then you can decrease the likelihood that cancer will emerge over the course of somebody's adult life. So if we target the parameters of evolution, that's a place where we can start. When it comes to therapy for cancers that are already existing, are already threatening people, thinking very carefully about how our treatments are exerting selection pressures on those populations, right? So if you have a very, very high dose therapy, the only cells that are going to be able to survive that are the cells that are resistant to that, that have some mechanisms, for example, pumping out the toxins from the cells that allow them to survive despite that toxin. And so if you use just high dose therapy, you select for the very cells that you don't want around, right? The cells that will be able to survive despite the therapy. There's a very exciting body of work that Bob Gatenby at Moffitt Cancer Center has really been leading um, using a strategy called adaptive therapy, which is essentially that you only treat the tumor when it's growing, and you begin by just knocking it back to a manageable size, and then you let it be unless it's growing. And if it's growing, then you treat it. And the idea of this is that rather than treating the tumor to try to get it to go away entirely, you treat it enough so that it doesn't overwhelm the host, but not so much that you are left only with cells that are resistant to the therapy. So you're essentially, I don't want to say cultivating, but you're sort of cultivating a tumor that is more tractable than a tumor would be if you just treated it with the highest dose therapies. This has been successful in prostate cancer for very late stage prostate cancer in clinical trials. And there's a lot of effort now to get clinical trials going in many other cancers as well. So it's a really exciting area for work kind of like domesticating your cancer, right? Turning the wolf into a dog to some extent. It's going to eat a little bit of food, but as long as it doesn't rampage through your house and eat your children, then it's okay. Yeah, you could almost think of it as a little pet that you keep inside you. It's like a little dangerous and you want to keep it muzzled, but you also don't want to train it to be nasty. Now, the metaphor breaks down a little bit in terms of the mechanisms because we're talking about evolutionary process on cells as opposed to cognitive process like with training. But nevertheless, I think that it can be useful to think about a tumor not as something that has to be inherently threatening that you have to eliminate, but rather something that you can and should manage proactively considering at all times that if you have a very aggressive approach, you could be left with a much less tractable Mm -hmm. situation in the future. So that's sort of the goal more broadly of evolutionary management, which is something that applies to cancer treatment. It applies to managing infectious disease. It applies to pest management, thinking about how do you create protocols and procedures that don't just respond in a knee-jerk way to the present problem, but rather consider what the evolutionary consequences will be of the actions that you're going to engage in and then try to shape that process of evolution in a way that is going to give you the desired outcome in the medium term. Now, this is a bit different when we hear about antibiotic resistance. They often say, make sure you take the full course of the antibiotics because you want to make sure that you get rid of every last pathogen in your body, right? Or at least reduce the pathogenic load to the point where your immune system can kind of wipe out whatever's left over. They would never say, stop taking it halfway through so that you can leave a few of the bacteria lying around in your gut, right? So why is the evolutionary trajectory of cancer within the body different than the evolutionary trajectory of bacteria? Well, in some ways it's not. So Andrew Reed, who, you know, is really the expert in infectious disease resistance, he will cautiously say these rules about taking every last 
antibiotic that you've got are really not based in evidence. And he has some evidence showing that sometimes when it comes to reducing the likelihood of antibiotic resistance, that it can make sense to follow a protocol that's more like what adaptive therapy is. But tricky, right, because of the sort of public health messaging issues around it. And there hasn't been, I think, enough systematic research into how do you actually do evolutionary management in public health in a way that will ultimately allow for less evolution of resistance. But it is also the case that oftentimes you get to a certain point and the immune system can take over, which makes it the case more so really in infectious disease than in cancer that leaving a little bit around for your body to mop up sometimes can make sense as well. There's a certain level on which your body can handle it. So a lot of open questions there, I think. A lot of places where we think that we have answers because we have very strong public health messaging, but there there's still open questions there if you look carefully at the science. Now, now what about disrupting cooperation? So we know that if you want to take out the enemy in modern warfare, you just knock out the cell phone towers and then, you know, the army kind of falls apart. So how can we disrupt the cooperation that goes on between cancer cells? I think there's a lot of interesting possibilities for strategies involving that. One thing is to potentially interfere with the cell's abilities to communicate with each other, the equivalent of knocking out the cell towers. If you can target the signaling systems that cancer cells use and that cancer cells use more than normal cells do, right, that's sort of the key piece, then that's one way that you could potentially disrupt cancer. Another is to interfere with the adhesion. So if there are situations where the cooperation is being facilitated by molecules that are allowing these cancer cells to stay in spatial proximity to one another. That's an area that can be interfered with. But there are a lot of challenges to interfering directly with a cooperation because many of those mechanisms are going to be co-opted from organism level cooperation function, and you don't want to disrupt that. So the question becomes, what are those mechanisms that are really specific to cancer? Or even if they're not 100% specific, that, you know, they're used much more by cancer cells than cells that are functioning properly in the rest of the body. And there are some other insights from life history modeling, where you can presumably get the cancer cells to think more long term and less short term. And maybe by providing them with a nice, comfortable environment where they can relax a little bit. Uh, That was very provocative. Could you talk a bit about how life history thinking could affect how we think about cancer? So life history theory is this idea that organisms can focus on fast reproduction, making lots of offspring or copies, or a sort of more survival, long-term oriented approach with fewer offspring. And one thing that we can consider and think about with cancer is that might actually be better off with cancer cells that are doing the latter. They're more slow, what we'd call slow life history. Now, if you look in ecology at what kinds of environments, what kinds of ecological worlds select for fast versus slow life history organisms, we see that if you have a lot of shocks to the system, a lot of sort of uncertainty and stability and resources, you get the evolution of these fast life history strategies. Live fast, die young, have a lot of offspring, which we probably don't want in cancer. But if, on the other hand, you have a sort of stable source of resources and ability to invest in the long term, then you do get the evolution of these strategies that are sort of more focused on survival and less so on reproduction. And so I could imagine situations where what we would want is to have a tumor that's going to stick around longer, you know, maybe the cells are hardier, they're able to survive in the body, they're able to propagate, but they don't grow as quickly. They're not as likely to move either. One of the other things with fast versus slow life history strategy is fast life history strategy, you tend to have selection for dispersal because you're getting shocks and then environments are also getting depleted because organisms are reproducing quickly. And so you have a sort of churn with fast life history theory or with fast life history strategists in general. That could potentially be a really bad thing for an organism that is dealing with cancer cells inside that are evolving in that way. Now, that's not to say that slow life history 
cell based cancer would be good. It's just probably less bad than fast life history cancer. How do these insights and ideas get diffused? I mean, it seems surprising that we haven't mapped over evolutionary thinking into the world of cancer or in the world of medicine in general. It's gradually infiltrating medicine more and more. But how could we have this multi-billion dollar research industry and clinical industry? And there's tons and tons of research that goes into cancer. What are the barriers to the diffusion of these kinds of new ideas? I remember I met Bill Hamilton at a conference, it might have been a conference you were at like 25 years ago or so, and he talked about how he only learned about what was going on in the field of economics after he was well into his career. What are some of the difficulties in arbitraging insights across these different domains? Now we're kind of like getting into the real challenges of interdisciplinarity. But I will say that the last 10, 15 years or so, there's been a huge influx of evolutionary theory, ecological theory into cancer biology. And a lot of people who are evolutionary and ecological theorists working on cancer and people who are oncologists and cancer biologists working on questions in evolutionary biology. My colleagues and I, you know, a long, long time ago, I, I actually don't remember when the first meeting was, but we started the International Society for Evolution, Ecology, and Cancer. I think it was maybe 2011. I'd have to look it up. But our goal was really to create a space where there wasn't the hierarchy of this is a cancer biology meeting, but we're going to invite some evolutionary biologists and ecologists, or this is an evolutionary meeting, but we're going to invite some cancer biologists. It was meant to be a society where there was no hierarchy of which discipline it was a society of. And trying to create a space where those conversations could start, where people could start porting those frameworks over, could share results, and find people to work with from across those divides. The community has just grown by leaps and bounds. Now the American Association of Cancer Researchers has a huge working group on evolution and cancer, in addition to the society that we have, which is about this inherent interdisciplinarity. But it's something that has now really grown a lot in the world of cancer biology. And there's also, you know, often sessions within evolution and ecology conferences that are about cancer. So it's growing. But I think you really do need to create spaces that are fundamentally interdisciplinary to get things like this off the ground. Because everybody needs to feel like they're approach and their perspective and their voices, the methods, their ideas, all, that all of those things are are important and that you're coming together to do something new and different as opposed to one discipline being in service to the other, for example. So I think those are really important ways to do it. I think with the International Society for Evolution, Ecology and Cancer, we've done some of those things right. We've helped to really get that community going. But there's obviously still a lot of room for growth. We actually just had a ISEEC executive board meeting earlier today for the society. And we have all sorts of fun ideas for how we're going to engage with broader audiences and make sure to bring the clinical perspective in. We'll be launching a live stream this spring, actually, that's going to allow general public to also engage with us around issues of cancer evolution and cancer research. So I'm excited about that. Do you see any challenges in the cultural approach to medicine and cancer? When somebody finds out that they have cancer, natural response is get rid of it, cut it out, right? We've seen that with prostate cancer. We see it with breast cancer. Someone finds out they've got the BRCA gene and they're like, start surgery. And the same thing is true with pathogens, right? The idea of living with COVID, nobody really wanted to live with COVID. That was just like, we got to get rid of this. We got to stop it and so forth. Is our approach to medicine one of just full steam ahead, let's attack things with all we've got. Is that going to be difficult, you think, to change? With respect to antibiotics and pest management, there was also some resistance to new kinds of ideas, right? I think that there is a strong response that we have if we find out that there's anything that's violating our boundaries, right? That is just like, get rid of it, get it out of me. Maybe 
related to kind of a disgust response to it's right like I'll just expel this thing that's the problem and as you mentioned it's also kind of part of the culture of how a lot of treatment happens it's focused on the sort of eradication and we use metaphors of war and not metaphors of cultivation or deflection Absolutely. Yeah. You know this because you read my book, but I really like the sort of contrast between the approach of Ares versus Athena in Greek mythology towards war, right? So Ares just loves getting out there and having the conflict and the bloodshed and the war, like for the sake of itself, let's go out there and fight. And it doesn't matter what the collateral damage is versus the Athena approach, which is to be really strategic in terms of thinking through, okay, if we do this, then what will the counterpart do? And then what would we do? And then, you know, what is the end that will come from any move that you make? And if you approach cancer in this way, it's almost like playing chess. You know that there will be a counter move in response to whatever move you make. Then you can do a much better job at actually having a medium and long-term outcome that's desirable because you're not just making your decisions on a move-by-move basis. I've been thinking about this, actually, because I've been playing chess with my son. And when one first starts playing chess, it's easy to just look at it one move at a time. You quickly realize that if your partner is looking a few moves ahead, then you're going to get creamed. And cancer, it's not a conscious entity in any way, but it's an evolutionary entity. And it evolves in response to the things that we do. It always will. And that means that just developing a new drug, we're never going to invent a drug or an approach where we get around the fact that cancer evolves. So we might as well deal with that and try to come up with approaches that take that into account and try ultimately to help support our body's natural cancer defenses for cancer prevention or so reducing the risk of cancer and hopefully supporting our body's natural ability to respond and get cancer under control when it does happen, right? So I think there's some immunotherapies that, you know, very promising for reasons that they're able to reactivate some of our sort of natural cellular cheater detection mechanisms, basically. So I think there's a lot of hope for using evolutionary approaches and thinking about the body as this entity that is fundamentally cellular cooperation that gets undermined with cancerous cellular Mm -hmm. cheating. But it does take a shift from the standard thinking that a lot of people do in our culture and in medical practice. It takes us being willing and able to consider coexistence with cancer as a thing that we would do. And I think that's hard for a lot of people, but maybe it makes it a little bit easier to realize that we're not the only species that has to coexist with cancer. All of multicellular life has to coexist with cancer and has since the dawn of multicellularity on this planet. Well, when I teach my strategy class, I say that strategy is the domain of war, business, Mm -hmm. and sport. But I have to also say that it also applies whenever you're dealing with an unthinking opponent Mm -hmm. like a disease or a pathogen or cancer. And so Mm -hmm. I'm going to steal your Aries versus Athena metaphor. And if with your permission, I'm going to have to create a new slide for my class. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Please do. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's always great to get the chance to talk about interdisciplinary approaches and great to have the chance to really get into it with you this last hour. So thanks for inviting me. So everybody check out The Cheating Cell, How Evolution Helps Us Understand and Treat Cancer. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 